So some of you might have seen this uh, story in Wired not that long ago, the three breakthroughs that have finally unleashed AI on the world. I'm, I'm here to sort of throw a little cold water and a little reality, I guess, onto that. So the three breakthroughs that Kevin Kelly talked about, the first two are undeniable, and, and you're all here for number two, um, cheap parallel computation and big data. We wouldn't be talking about big data if we didn't have cheap par parallel computation. The third is supposed to be advances in algorithms, and people are primarily talking about deep learning. I don't want to say we should throw away deep learning, but I think we need to have a realistic picture about what it's doing and what its limitations are. So Kelly said that we have this perfect storm of parallel computation, bigger data, and deeper algorithms that have generated the 60 years in the making overnight success of AI. I'm not sure we've actually had that success of AI yet. We're certainly finding some applications like recommendation engines, which are great, but there's a, lot, a long way to go. I, I always like to think of this quote from Peter Thiel. He says, we wanted flying cars, and instead we got 140 characters. Like We need to keep in perspective what it is that we've accomplished and where we'd really like to go. So when I was a kid, I saw Rosie the Robot. Now that I have kids, I want Rosie the Robot. I want someone that can, you know, some machine that can take care of the kids and the household uh, and so forth. What we really have is more like Roomba, which is like a hockey puck, pick, hockey puck that goes around and maybe picks up some of the dust some of the time. Um, this, this is the closest to Rosie the Robot that I know, if I can get the animation to work. Um, this is a, a real-world robot that is able to do kind of arbitrary tasks that you can set to do one task or the other. But it can't really do arbitrary tasks, and then when you wait long enough, you'll start to see humans in the background, and you'll realize that this has actually been sped up by like a factor of 60. So, um, you know, Rosie the Robot is not really here. We don't really have the AI um, that we need uh, just yet to do arbitrary tasks. Um, Kurzweil is always talking about exponential progress in AI, and it might feel that way lately with, for example, the progress in Go. Um, there are narrow domains where we can build AI pretty well. The problem is really in broad problems and open-ended problems. What I would like to show you now is data for strong AI, for artificial intelligence that could solve open-ended problems. Um, unfortunately, they don't exist, so as a licensed college professor, I made them up. Um, and what I have here is Eliza in 1965 and Siri in roughly now um, on my hypothetical measure of strong AI. Well, Eliza was able to fool people into thinking it was a real therapist back in 1965. Chatbots are not new. We have better chatbots now, but they're still not able to sort of understand arbitrary conversations without very quickly saying ridiculous things. So why don't we have strong AI or artificial general intelligence yet when we finally do have the big data and we finally have the parallel compute, cheap parallel compute? What explains the gap between the hype about AI where you know, people think that we're going to lose our jobs next week and the reality of what AI can do, which is actually pretty limited? Um, the answer, I think, is that almost all the hype is about deep learning, which is a great technique, but it's only part of what we need for AI, and we need to put it in perspective. What it really is, deep learning, is just a fancy way of doing automatic pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is part of cognition of how we think, and it's part of what artificial intelligence needs to do. You need to see things. You need to be able to understand what you're seeing. You might think of deep learning as something like the early layers of visual cortex. It's what part of the brain does. But there's lots of other systems like the prefrontal cortex that are doing decision making and language and so forth that we haven't yet understood the principles of. So most of deep learning takes its cue from an idea from the late 1950s um, that Hubel and Wiesel won the Nobel Prize for. And the idea is simply that you have simple cells that feed into more complex cells that feed into still more complicated cells. And from that, you get a kind of abstraction. So you might recognize letters after first recognizing strokes of letters. And it's been around for a long time. There's good evidence for it back to the 50s. There's evidence now, for example, that the brain has abstract cells that, represent, um, that recognize things like Oprah Winfrey. So there's an Oprah Winfrey detector cell in at least some people's brains. Um, and this is consistent with this idea of a hierarchy of feature detectors, is the technical term for it. And this is exactly what drives deep learning. This is how these systems work. But that doesn't mean that it's a full solution to all the things we need to do in cognition.